Well, what uh, the Europeans found out long before we did is that when you have manufacturing in which releases fluorine gas, hydrogen fluoride gas, that that gas is extremely toxic uh, at concentrations far less than what you're adding to water. Uh, so when you breathe it, it's, it's much more toxic. Uh, they had incidences uh, where the gas would be trapped in a valley and killed uh, hundreds of people or, or made thousands sick. So the Europeans very early knew how toxic fluoride was, and they made sure that all these plants uh, had special safeguards to prevent that from ever happening again. Well, we had the same sort of accidents in the United States in which the fluorine gas was released. Uh, cattle were killed, cattle were born with mutations. Uh, the farmers were uh, sickened, crops were ruined because it'll destroy plants just like it will humans. Well, we had this tremendous effect from the, this gas being released from an aluminum plant. The idea was that at the same time, the Manhattan Project had to use a lot of fluoride to purify uranium to make the bombs. Uh, and they were making tons of it, and they were farming it out to various companies like DuPont and Alcoa Aluminum. Uh, when they were doing this purification process, a lot of this hydrogen fluoride gas was being released into the atmosphere, and it damaged all these farms around it. The government was keeping secret records of the fact that fluoride was having on neurological function, in other words, the brain, high, the ability to think and neurological effects. They also recorded the fact that when uh, the workers that were working around the fluorine uh, gas uh, lost their teeth, and they made the notation that they had fewer cavities because they had fewer teeth. Some were completely dentuous, they didn't have any teeth. Uh, it was at that point that all of these uh, companies were at risk of being sued uh, because of people damaged around their plants and because of farms destroyed and farm animals. So to prevent lawsuits, they needed a way to say that fluoride was completely safe. Uh, the owner of the uh, Alcoa Aluminum Company happened to be the Secretary of Treasury, which uh, under his um, power was the U.S. Uh, Public Health Service. So they concocted a plan to uh, uh, say that putting fluoride in water prevented cavities. Uh, and they hired a dentist to go around the country and look at places that had normally high fluoride. And what they found was uh, that the places uh, that had natural high fluoride, there was fewer cavities. And again, it was based on the fact that these kids had delayed eruption of their teeth, so they had fewer teeth and had fewer cavities. The dentist that actually did this study also made the notation that these children had severe fluorosis, that is destruction of their teeth by the fluoride. And he recommended that fluoride not be added to water, that the main problem was try to get fluoride out of the water. And he also made the notation that there was scientific literature at the time that showed that fluoride at that concentration caused DNA damage and was a cellular toxin. The American Dental Association at that time even came out and asked him not to put fluoride in water that in fact it was a uh, protoplasmic poison. But after they were uh, approached by the U.S. Public Health Service, they changed their mind. All of the literature began to change and they began to put fluoride in the water. And every court case that came up for a lawsuit, they say, how could it be possibly poisonous when they're adding it to water to prevent cavities? And that's why it was in the water. Do you see um, any other examples? That makes me think of like going into a used bookstore and seeing an old medical text from like the 1940s or whatever and seeing how their description of different conditions can be very different. And a lot of that has to do obviously with discoveries, but a lot of that also has to do, it seems like, with a different presentation of things like fluoride or whatever. Can you think of other examples of how the well, truth like changes? Like mercury in the, in the early literature, that is from the 1800s to the 1920s, uh, there was an extensive scientific literature about the toxicity of mercury. Uh, and in fact, in the very first uh, dental association, uh, it was uh, a rule that you could not fill teeth with mercury because it was so toxic and that everyone knew from the scientific literature that it caused brain toxicity and nerve toxicity and even heart toxicity. Uh, so they would be thrown out of the dental association if they put mercury in people's teeth. Well, so many dentists were putting mercury in teeth, violating the rule that that dental society collapsed. They formed their own society called the American Dental Society. 
And then they started endorsing putting uh, mercury fillings in the teeth, and that's how that came about. So it shows that despite all of this massive scientific evidence and clinical evidence of the harmful effect of mercury, uh, for profit, they changed the scientific literature. Uh, now, it didn't mean that after that there was scientific evidence that mercury was not harmful. It's just they quit talking about it. And they began to lie about it, saying the mercury wasn't released from the teeth, even though there was hard scientific evidence that shows the mercury is released from the teeth and that it produces brain damage. We're going through the same thing with vaccines. We've gone through the same thing with monosodium glutamate. And we've gone through the same thing with aspartame. Uh, they change the scientific impression that the public sees so that they can sell their product. 